Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the public online lecture series, Mobility Analysis and Planning for Human Skill Cities. The lecture series is arranged by the Mobility Lab of the University of Tartu, Estonia, and it is arranged within the master level course, Transport Planning. The lecture series seeks to answer the question of how mobility analysis and transport planning can promote human skill, sustainable and just cities. We have invited here experts and leading scholars from the fields of human geography, transport planning, public health and sociology from Estonia, Europe and beyond. The lecture series takes or the lectures take place either on Tuesdays or Thursdays and the series will last until the end of April. More information on the lectures you can find from the website transportplanning.ut.ee. And if you have questions during the lecture, please post them on chat or then raise your hand after uh, the lecture is, is over. We will have a questions and answers section in the end. Today, we are very happy to welcome here Professor Malene Freudendal Pedersen, who gives a lecture on sustainable mobilities in the human scale city. Malene is a professor in urban planning at Aalborg University, and she leads the Planning for Urban Sustainability Research Group. She has an interdisciplinary background linking sociology, geography, urban planning, and the sociology of technology. Her research has been strongly inspired by the mobility term. Previously, her work was primarily focused on investigating everyday life practices of mobilities. And currently, she investigates the transition into sustainable mobilities and its impact on everyday life communities, societies, and cities. So welcome, Malena. The screen is now yours. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm really happy to be here and uh, be allowed to uh, talk uh, on my research um, with your students. Um, there, and there we go. Yes, as um, Eok just said, I'm going to talk about sustainable mobilities in the human scale city. And um, first, I'm going to talk about a little bit about mobilities, and I'm talking a little bit about the human scale cities, just to know where it is that I'm basically placed, uh, which kind of theoretical orientation that I'm approaching this um, question of movement and how to make it sustainable. And first of all, this is just to um, <clears throat> introduce also what Oga just said, that I have a transdisciplinary education. And that means that I have a center in everyday life, uh, not because I think everyday life is something that uh, is just about what goes on in the home, but because I think it's one of these things that we don't pay enough attention to when, when everyday life is basically also part of the technologies, how we use them, the planning, the environment, the communities we make, the way we create societies, the way we create planning. So everyday life is something that is extremely essential to understand in order to also understand how all the other practices that we're doing, be it, um, <clears throat> be it a planning practice or be it a political practice uh, is basically also connected to the way everyday day life works. And the two pictures you see on the side is basically just also to say that I'm not looking at the city and its mobilities from like a bird's perspective, but I'm more on street level understanding what is actually going on, why does it matter to people, um, and why are they doing things the way they're doing it. So mobilities research is just important to basically start out with saying this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. I'm going to do it fairly quickly. But just for those of you who doesn't know the differences between <clears throat> transport, mobility and mobilities, I think it's a pretty important point to get across because it also makes a difference on the way you approach your research subjects. Where transport is very much about movement, getting from A to B, changing places. Um, mobility is also taking in this thing that we can actually be active in motion. You often see transport and mobility just replacing uh, each other a um, little bit here and a little bit there, and sometimes without any significant change in what it was before. 
But what mobility is, is, is that it's a research paradigm that is looking at movement as constituting social conditions and building and maintaining social relations. It's also building and maintaining economies, um, uh, political issues, um, different kinds of um, nation states. Uh, so the whole idea with mobility is, is basically to look on all the things movement is apart from getting from one place to the other. John uh, said in 2007 in his book, Mobilities, he said there's too much transport in the study of travel and not enough society and thinking through the complex intersecting relations between society and transport. And what he did was that he actually listed five kinds of movement that all influence each other. The whole idea is basically saying when we take one of them out and investigate it, isolate it from the others, we are missing important points. And he talked about the corporal travel of people, the physical movement of objects, the imaginative travel, the virtual travel, and the communicative travel. Today, when we think about movements, if we think about everyday uh, moving, like using the car or using the train or going by bike, there is always a lot of virtual um, mobilities involved in that, be it DPS systems, be it phones, be it music, being travel planners. Um, and a lot of this travel is done together with other people, some people that we're just moving with without talking to them, but also a lot of social relations are being taken care of through traveling. And this is basically, the point is here that where transport is basically about getting from A to B, mobility research is also interested in figuring out what comes before A, what is the reason to travel in the first place and what comes after B, because you just didn't travel today. If you traveled and you're not just traveling virtually, but if you travel physically, you just didn't go to the university to just be at the university. There's a reason to go there, to learn something, to meet your fellow students. So. So the reason for traveling is basically in what is there. And also within mobilities research, there's a lot of focus on the meaning of what happens in the movement. Within transport research, movement, moving time has for many years been seen as dead time, but within the mobilities research, um, it is, it is there's a lot of research basically looking into how that time is qualitative time for a lot of people. There's a lot of people for whom the car trip to and from work is the only place during the day they have time for themselves. So this is also a big part of why they want to use the car, because they have time alone to think about the world or to read a book. So basically, you could say by looking at mobilities, we can understand social premises for transport. We can see people's projects and plans today and in the future. So this is what I'm giving you on mobilities, but just to know, so you know that this is the outset with which I'm looking at urban planning and mobilities and how to make it sustainable. And when I talk about the human scale city, it is basically very much inspired from Jan Gehl. He originally wrote this book, Life Between Buildings, which it's called, I think it's translated the first time in the 90s or something, but the original book is actually from 71. So it's a, an old book in Denmark um, where it was already here. He started talking about who actually have the right to the spaces in the city. What are we using the space in between the houses for? Are we using it to uh, facilitate car transport? Are we using it for people? Um, how are we doing it? Um, and the human scale uh, city is basically also out as a film. If you haven't seen that, I can absolutely um, recommend it because it shows some of the work that Jan Gehl and his company have done with getting planners to actually look at the urban spaces in a different way. And just to, to just give just one number on this. Recently, um, it's the first time I've ever seen numbers on it in Denmark uh, or in Copenhagen because they made a new um, statement on the mobility and environment. And in a city like Copenhagen, where a lot of people are biking and a lot of people are walking and there's a lot of public transport, it's 54% of the space between the houses that are used to facilitate cars. So 54% is used for cars, uh, roads, and parking. And that's actually a quite high number. And that is in a city like Copenhagen. So that can only make you imagine how high that number is in many other places. 
So basically the human scale cities is a way of talking about the right to the city or the fight over space or whose commons these spaces between the houses actually are and what they should be used for. And then I have this disclaimer and it's not always I'm showing it, but since I don't know all of you very well, I better show it. And the disclaimer is I don't have a problem with the car. I should always remember to say that. I don't have a problem with the technology. I have a problem with the unintended consequences from the technology. I have a, a, an issue with how much space it takes, how much um, we use it, um, but not the car in itself as a technology. I also think it's a very practical and smart technology that we've been, been meant a lot for the building of modern societies. Um, but basically, one of the things that happened exactly due to this role the car came to play because it was so practical is that there was this modernistic planning idea moved forward by Le Corbusier and his involvement in the CM planning doctrine and the Athens Charter. It was basically a way of after the Second World War, think about how do we get clean, efficient cities? How do we uh, get back on track after some of of these ways, uh, especially the Second World War, um, ruined a lot of cities. Um, and that created an urban planning with a primary objective of economic growth. And it's been dominant in the last and current century. And it's centered on an infrastructure system dominated by an auto logic. And auto logic is the internal growth logic of planning systems and policies that primarily focuses on the accessibility and efficiency of the private car. And basically the whole idea in this is that cars create economic growth. That has been um, throughout modernity and in the years um, where we needed to rebuild um, different kind of uh, production systems and we got the opportunity to move out from the dirty and noisy cities, it has been um, the way that it was a, a driver for economic growth. The problem is just that we now in 2022 still many in many ways treat the car that way because what we have now is that we actually have a system where the unintended consequences and what we have to pay to actually um, re-establish some of these things that the um, that this technology is is putting on cities and putting on um, the climate. Malene, I'm sorry, uh, you are muted. I don't know how that happened. I didn't. I didn't touch the computer. <laughs> how long That's have fine. I been unmuted? Sorry. Uh, okay. For, for 20 seconds. Okay, good. No problem. Um, perfect. And then basically what Hayer said in 1999, he said that these modern planning paradigms, they are still techno technocentric with an ideal of flow and zero friction. So it's all about moving as fast as possible and without anything that creates obstacles. And of course, um, we can see from a lot of research around the world on what happened during those years of modernization, um, public transport uh, and pedestrians and bikers, they are inhibiting the flow. Um, so the more clean we get the spaces, the more flow we get for the car. And the dominating neoliberal concept of an economy based on global flows of trade and workforce has resulted in an unchallenged principle of seamless mobility as the pathway for efficient organizations of cities. And what somebody like me is arguing is in this tr tradition, the question on why and for what often seems to be missing, why do we need more efficiency? Why do we need more of these flows? Because what we know, it's called induced traffic. The more roads we build, the more cars get back on the road. So maybe it's about time that we start thinking about the consequences from thinking this way about transport uh, and how can we actually do it in a different way. But one of the things that gets problematic with the car as the dominant technology is it's more than just a mode of transport, technical device or artifact, which one can use for the purpose of social actions. It's an essential part of a modern way of life. We know that from the research on people who have cars and what they use it for is that 
uh, commuting is only 30% of the trips that are made, even though commuting most of the time is 100% of the argument for having more efficiency for cars. Um, and Nigel Thrift said uh, in 2004 that 100 years or so after the birth of the automobility, the experience of driving is sinking into our technological unconsciousness and producing a phenomenology that we increasingly take for granted. We are so used to having this that it's very difficult. What we can see from the research on why people drive is that the minute they get the car, it becomes the thing you use for everything, for all trips, also the short trips. Um, because mobility on an everyday life is not something we are reflexive about. It's not that something we think through every day before we do it. We just do it. We think about what we have to do at work or how we have to get our kids to some kind of um, sports um, thing or how we have to get ourselves to some kind of event or sports thing. So we don't think about how we get there. And once we get used to the car, it's just something we don't think about. We just do it. But of course, it has consequences, because for most cities, this auto logic resulted in an optimization of the automobile system that intensified and accelerated climate change, the standstill in urban traffic, and the ongoing destruction of public spaces. The pictures I have on the side here are pictures from Copenhagen, and it's always good to bring these people pictures because people always think Copenhagen, there's a lot of cyclists, so this is all there is on the street. But we also have a lot of cars in Copenhagen, and they actually also take up a lot of space. And the uncertainty said in 2007 that it may well be that cities are more often the product of unintended consequences than of everything else. And he said that in connection with the Urban Age project. Um, the Urban Age project was, it's still um, a master, I think, but it was a big project at the London School of Economics where some researchers went around to a lot of big cities in the world and they talk to the planners and the politicians um, and practitioners in these cities and looked at what is it that you did to plan this city? What was the routines? Why did you do it the way you did it? A lot of it is about a lot of other things than transport, but it's very much, uh, or it's very interesting to see on the transport part that a lot of these um, planners, especially in these big cities where the car is very much in center, talk about how they actually ruined the subtle life of the cities because they were so um, focused on making this flow and zero friction in the cities. Um, and that also meant that they pushed out other modes than the car from a lot of uh, movement spaces. This also had consequences for suburbs because this is basically um, how we then ended up building a lot of the small cities outside of or suburb cities outside of bigger cities where there was no other activity than actually sleep uh, and dwell in your house, but working, uh, going to school, shopping is all, all, all things that are at a distance where it actually makes the most sense to have a car to do it because that's the way you get access. Um, and there are many places around the world where uh, you don't even have sidewalks in these areas because it's just so much taken for granted that the car is the main mode of transport. And uh, the cartoon down there is it's a Danish, some Danish very famous cartoonists, but they are basically saying that the follow up to this rolling grass that you, the fixed grass you can just roll out is like this rolling suburb because this is very much how we see it's planned many places. They're basically just rolling out this system with roads and grass and small houses without actually thinking about, um, is this the right place to have it? And I'm not gonna go into a density discussion here, but density is of course an important part of sustainability as well. Then there has been different approaches to think about sustainable transport. Um, it is not a new thing current patterns of transportations with the dominant patterns of energy use are not sustainable and on present trends may compound the environmental problems the world is facing. This is from 97. Uh, and it is not a new thing. It's been going on again and again that both the UN and the EU has been coming up with uh, 
with research showing that we have an issue with transportation, we have an issue with the private car um, that that there should be done something about. But so far, I would say um, it's been not very successful. So it is one of the big issues that we still need to solve. Um, then there has been these uh, sustainable mobility plans that um, that the EU put in. Uh, it's a multi-criteria analysis that must focus on four major areas, new technologies, demand management, land use development, and what they call soft measures. Uh, so basically here we have uh, from Holden and Bannister an attempt to say, okay, we need to look at more elements of what movement actually is um, in order to change the current practices. And I'm not going to talk much about that. It's interesting that a country like Denmark doesn't use these sustainable mobility plans a lot to promote cycling, for instance, because it's always the, the thinking has been part of the the way municipalities has been working with it, but I know a lot of other places in Europe specifically that this is actually quite important for planners as a tool to argue for different ways of looking at mobility. But one of the things I have to say about this is that we have an issue in the way we are planning uh, transportation. Um, and it is economies, it's statistics, it's modeling and quantitative methods. And all the things that has to do with society and culture and practices that we need to use qualitative methods to understand actually is much less significant in the way that we are planning mobilities in cities. Um, and you could say the problem with the things that Bannister called soft measures is should not be called soft measures. We need to get rid of those words because there's also a hierarchy see, in the way we talk about these different things. There's the hard measures, there's the data, then there's the soft measures, uh, but that's different kind of data. But already in these two, and you can probably guess that from the pictures I have here, already in these two, there is a power difference that is basically a big reason to why um, we don't make sure that these other elements of what movement is get a more significant place in the way we plan it. And what I'm just saying is that it's we just need to get rid of these terms because they are not doing anything good and we should just put context on what it is that we want. We want knowledge about accessibility, safety, gender, time use, trips and kilometers driven. And we use ICT uh, or we use databases, modeling, predict and provide, or we want knowledge about culture, practice, everyday life, and we use um, different kind of tools, communication, urban planning, practice change. But what I'm saying by looking, but having these two categories, and I know it's two, the reason why I'm saying it here is because it's two categories that are very often used within transportation or always used within transportation. And somehow everything that has to do with um, moving in different ways than uh, in a big metal box or um, thinking about things, um, how people actually live their life, what actually matters to people, it has come into a box where it's become less significant. So I have a new book coming out where I'm writing much more about this. And But this is just one of my very important points that I just wanted to use the opportunity to say. I'm now moving on. But I just wanted to push that in. Don't use those words. Put context on content on what we want. Because as my sociology friends would say, somehow culture ended up in a soft category, but there's nothing soft about culture. It's a really hardcore uh, category of how things work. So social change and technology has always been connected to each other. There's nothing new in that. In the 19th century, they were steam powered printing and telegraph. Um, in the 20th century, the telephone, the radio, and the television. And in the 21st century, the internet was the communication media. Um, and this is from Rupkin's book. And it's basically always important to look at the social construction of technologies. What kind of significance is it that we're giving to it? Uh, what is it that we think it can do? Because we do live in a world where these different technologies plays a quite important role. Sometimes the idea about what role they're going to play can also be part of um, creating planning uh, and transport planning in a specific way. And the smart city is basically one of these 
concepts that has been um, used as a way of thinking about how to create sustainable cities. And these smart cities are considered as coded spaces facilitating self-learning, socio-technical environments grounded in IT and artificial intelligence, where software is applied to facilitate the efficient use of resources, space, infrastructures, and energy to provide user friendliness and sustainability. Or they're seen as assemblages of technology uh, of technologies aimed at increasing competitiveness, administrative efficiency, and social inclusion. And basically, I love these pictures of smartness because what these pictures of smartness and the smart city and automation are often picturing is something that is totally removed from the way we live our everyday life. My favorite one is definitely the one with the teenage girl, uh, the small kid in the back and the dog in the front seat, because what, what kind of imagination do we have when we think that in the future, parents don't want to give their kids to the responsible grown up in the kindergarten and make sure that they are received in a good way, the kids are happy and we have the feeling that they have a good day. When are we going to change humans that much that parents just want to stuff their kid in an automated car and say goodbye in front of the car? I don't see it happening. Uh, and this is where sometimes we get so we get so crazy about how cool the technology is that we actually forget about the lives that are lived around this technology and how it should be lived. And that means we need to rethink the concept of smart cities in a wider social political perspective and infuse its discourses with an understanding of all the things cities are and not only what kind of technologies we can put into them. What are cities also about? What do they do to people? What do they do to people's lives? And Martin Heyer said at some point, we need smart urbanism rather than smart cities. This is not the same as saying that smart cities doesn't have potential. It's not the same as saying that all these smart technologies can't be used to a lot of stuff for a lot of stuff and also can be part of creating sustainability. But we cannot just stuff them into um, the city or wherever we're living without thinking about how are they actually going to be received? How are they going to be used? And what is it that we want to do with the city? How do we want to live our lives here? And this is just another example of all these automated driving uh, places, because the part that is taken in is the, um, this is basically what people say about the train that they took into the idea of automated driving, that when you are using the train to commute, you can work there and you can get a lot of stuff done. So now they are, or you can talk to people or you can uh, start a party or play a card game. So this is now everything they're now putting into this technology. But what is interesting about it is that it's still an individual mode of transport. It's still uh, a mode of transport that means that we need to have a lot of them. So uh, it doesn't matter if they're automated as long as the amount is still that big. And this is just to show how some of these, this is a movie, uh, online movie, basically to show how do they imagine city spaces when they talk about automation. And I don't know about you, but I at least wouldn't like to live in that city. And I also know that um, the city we live in uh, looks quite different. And I actually, this is where you put another slide first. I'm just gonna skip that and go back to it because this is how cities look. They're not ordered in systems. They're not ordered in structures. They're not clean from interaction. People are walking and talking and doing all kinds of different stuff on top of each other. And this kind of city that we like and that is on the list of livable cities is not the clean city where we have a separate uh, tracks of flow. And basically there is also analysis um, that shows that moving away from combustion to electric powertrains is likely to reduce the burden of passengers um, and uh, the burden of passenger vehicles travel in most environmental impact categories. It also shows that gains on a similar scale can be made by selecting smaller vehicle and using them more intensively over their lifetime. In fact, environmental burdens in all impact categories and total ownership costs are quite sensitive to decreasing vehicle mass and increasing vehicle lifetime. 
this is basically an article where they went in and then they looked at all the different modes or all the different um, fuel technologies um, that you could use in cars and made life cycles analysis on them. What does it cost in energy to produce them and the batteries and the hydrogen, all that stuff. But basically what they came out with was saying, there is no doubt that um, energy is uh, electric cars are better than combustion engine cars. But our biggest problem right now is actually that we buy more and more cars and we don't keep them that long and also that they get bigger and bigger. Um, and that's just an important um, or the point I want to make with this is just to say that that it's not that all these new technologies can't be used for something. We just need to be careful that we don't try to solve problems that can't be solved with these things. Um, and this is basically one of the things I'm also very interested in because when we look at how new architectural firms show new urban planning development areas, this is what they sell to the citizens. This is what they sell to the politicians there was never cars on the pictures. So we make planning for a lot of cars, but nobody, everybody knows that if you're an architect, you know you can't sell a new urban area development if there's a lot of cars. So what they show is the leisure part. It's the biking, is the public transport, um, it's the pedestrians, but they don't show the cars. And some of these pictures are from an, an urban area in Copenhagen where they have 30,000 housing units and they have industries, small industries. And of course, there's much more cars out there than you see on the pictures, but they're just not present on the part of the material we use to sell this place. So somehow we also live in, in a world where we know about the car, we know about the issues, but we also basically, we don't put it out there. We put fantasy stories out or, but, but, the real issues there actually is with this technology, we're actually really bad at talking about. We're bad at talking about that which doesn't work with the car. We only talk about the good things. Um, so if you want to investigate this, and I often hear that there is um, not enough knowledge on, on people's behavior. There's a difference between behavior and practice. You will notice I'm talking about practice. That is because behavior is very much focused on a cognitive element in people. That means you just need to explain to them how they should do things in a different way through communication, then they will change their way of doing it. Whereas practice is much more focused on um, all of these elements in a life, like the, which kind of competences do you have? Which kind of meaning making do you have? What kind of materials are available? That are different elements that actually together forms the way you do things um but uh, and that means that for Lisbeth Shaw who's also a practice researcher but she's calling this um behavior approach she's calling it the ABC approach so social change is thought to depend upon values and attitudes which are believed to drive the kinds of behavior the B that individuals choose to adopt whereas practice is providing um, an alternative understanding of the complex dynamics between the elements that constitutes the practice, allowing it to be considered as a social issue rather than focused solely on individual, individual behavior. One of the major points within practice research is also that changing everyday practice shouldn't be individualized because there's such a big part of the way how we're doing things that is something individuals do in relation to others. And it's the way they're also making meaning in relation and the way um, politics and planning are also making meaning in a specific way that is actually also part of driving what we do. The way the surroundings are also designed also has an important um, aspect in, do, in, in how we do things. So it's basically a way of trying to connect these things instead of only looking at individuals. And you could say what practice is, it's, it's a set of doing and saying organized by a pools of understandings. In mobilities, there has been this way of thinking about it in relations to recrafting practices, where you say, okay, this is a policy, in, policy intervention that replaces existing social technical systems by changing the elements of existing practices. So um, 
or substituting where we are attempting to replace transportation by discourage and replace current practices with more sustainable alternatives. Um, and there is changing how practices interlock, which is addressing interventions in the complex interconnections of mobility modes and everyday practices in order to change the level, scale, and character of current demand for mobility. You could say that in the recrafting, it could be replacing, um, it would be mobility as a service, for instance, could be instead of using your own car, you have a shared car. Um, substituting practices could be something related to working more from home. So the, the, the transportation thing is changing and changing how practices interlock is basically also something about not building uh, schools with a big parking lot. So you are inviting parents to hand to uh, deliver their kids to school by car. Uh, and basically thinking about practices as something that can be recrafted, substituted or changed is also a way of not making one size fits all for everything, because this is also one of the big problems we have when we talk about redoing into sustainable mobility. We think we can do a one size fits all where we actually forget to look at how people's everyday lives are organized. I always say, when you ask people to get rid of their car, you ask them to reorganize their everyday life. And of course they don't want that. So planning actually has a lot of opportunities to help in the way that they are planning urban space to, to redo the organization of everyday life in a way that it makes sense. If for instance, you make a um, 15 minute city where there is safe ways for kids to bike. You suddenly have kids that can transport themselves. You don't have to show for them. You get extra time in the morning. Uh, the kids are happy because they can go with their uh, schoolmates. So there's a lot of things in the way we also plan cities that actually has a big influence on how we can use transportation. And just to show you an example, um, I'm just gonna talk shortly about uh, what is called Stroikere in Copenhagen. I tried to translate it into Amble Streets. Um, it's a little bit difficult to translate because Stroi actually means shopping street. So the direct translation would be a shopping street street, which doesn't sound very good. So I made it into Amble instead. Um, but the whole idea is to take a neighborhood street and say, we want to redo the way this street works because there is not enough space for all the transport modes. And then they said, we want to make these uh, neighborhood streets so the urban space are beautified and urban life strengthened. Cyclist condition must be improved on stressed route and public transport needs to be strengthened by allowing for shorter travel time and increased regularity for buses. When this was first done in uh, Copenhagen, it was an uh, experiment. Um, because the quick reader can easily see that these three points basically means that space is taken away from the car. But at that point, I'm not even sure we could do it now, now but maybe more now, but at least in, in 2008, you couldn't have a discussion on anything that had to do with the city, which was about taking away space from the car. Um, but basically what they did on this street was they said, how many people are biking, how many people are using public transport, how many people are walking, and how many people are taking the car. Let's distribute it space after that in a fair way. So those that are most of get most space. But what of course happened with these experiments when they are, because this is what we see in many places around the world that once people get used to not having the car there, they actually highly appreciate what kind of urban space there is instead and the movement there is in that urban space, which basically meant that it became um, a permanent solution. And um, you can see here the pictures I have here, the top picture is, from before the traffic trial. The middle picture is during the traffic trial that was basically just done with movable furniture and colors on the road to indicate that it was a different way of doing it. And the last picture is after the construction. And what you can see if you look closely is that there's actually three people next to each other on that bike path and there's still space for one more. And you can see the, the bus islands and a bus islands works in that way. I don't know if you have those in, um, I, um, I don't know if you have those. Um, Estonia, <laughs> sorry about that. That was really embarrassing. I totally slipped. 
what was the capital? No, doesn't matter. I remembered it in the end. Um, that where the bus I island you have um when you get off as a passenger and there are bikers on the bike path, you have to wait until there's a clear access. So that means it actually gives a lot more flow from for the bikers because they don't constantly have to stop and wait for the passengers from the bus. And basically before uh, this traffic trial was done, it was Jan Gehl's architect firm that made the investigation and they said pedestrian fights for space on narrow sidewalks under a high noise level, making it difficult to talk together. The over 10,000 cyclists ride dangerously close to crowded cycle path and for cars, Nurbo is a maze many preferably avoid. So the whole pre-investigation on this neighborhood street was basically, and of course also for a reason by Copenhagen uh, municipality, they asked Gale Architect because they knew that focus would be on making this a livable place. And this is just one of my, uh, in an interview came from one of my interviews with cyclists where a cyclist say like one of the really cool things in Copenhagen on a book, it's really, really cool that you feel you are a priority and privileged and that people have considered you, there's room for you. There are many places where the bike pad is as wide as the road, it's a real priority. Because of course it matters for the cyclists, there is so many of them and a lot of the, the a big problem is basically having enough space. Um, one of the big challenges we have in Copenhagen these days is actually all the bikers there is because parents begin to think it's a little bit dangerous for their kids to bike and all people um, feel insecure in traffic because there is so many people on bikes. So it matters that there is, they give get more space. What they also did, which was quite uh, clever, was that because when uh, Poker was made, the first neighborhood street, of course, there was the um, usual complaint that this would be really bad for the businesses on um, Nurburgr. And when they decided to do uh, the next neighborhood street, which is Amapoga, the um, Komen municipality went out and then they made an investigation. And more and more of those are actually coming up. It's a new thing. They started to come uh, about how, what does it actually mean for these streets that are redeveloped in relation to the shops on them? Do they lose business or not? And they realized with Nurburgr they didn't lose business. Of course, there was a problem for some of the stores, which were basically like the wooden store, the, the place where you can get tools and wood and the paint store. But in general, um, it was actually in a way that, um, yeah, Amaboga was decided to make in 2008, is that it's actually good for business. And that means the Copenhagen municipality said in their press release, we're giving 40 millions to start the work to create an attractive ample street. We give the stores and the consumers better conditions by giving more space to pedestrians, cyclists, and users of public transport, which constitutes 80% of shoppers in Copenhagen. So instead of buying into the, the discussion that car traffic would mean that there was be, going to be no business for, or the business wouldn't survive. They instead took that story and turned it around because it's one of the very typical stories whenever we talk about redoing urban spaces. In Copenhagen, it was exactly the same story we had when we made the big pedestrian zone in 65 or something like that. So it's kind of the same kind of stories, the same kind of arguments, because we have a lot of stories linked to what the car is actually doing for us. And in that sense, this was quite clever to basically say, okay, this is one of these stories we need to get our hands on um, to change um, and say, this is actually not the way it works. The fact is that they are actually, it's better to have a street with a lot of cyclists and pedestrians, because they are the ones who just either go in or park their bike and go into the store. And there was also another one of the newest one is called Nord of um, where they made much more citizen involvement. And they could, of course, do that because we already had two of these neighborhood streets, but they made the citizen involvement that was called put words on the street. And um, they made two maps, what do you want to change uh, and what do you want to keep? And you can see the bottom picture is basically one of these maps. People could put red dots on what they wanted to keep and what they wanted to change. And then they could also write post it on what they wanted in the area. And what they themselves could then see by this process was that they wanted to keep it all. 
uh, they wanted to have the parking spaces, they wanted to have uh, the bikers, they wanted to have the bus, but they also wanted to make um, more urban areas. They wanted to give the stores the opportunity to put um, grow uh, stuff on the street. They wanted to have uh, playgrounds, they wanted to have dwelling places. And by doing it that way, it actually ended up that the citizens of that street wanted to have a cycling street instead of an amble street. Uh, and a cycle street um, allows for car traffic at 20 kilometers per hour. Speed limit cycle traffic comes first. There is a flexible use of city space so that the same spaces are used for car parking, cycle parking, and commerce on different hours and days. So basically by putting them in that situation and having to figure out what do we want to do with this limited amount of space we have, they actually ended up making a much um, more restrictive uh, suggestion than they were against in the first place. Um, so basically, this is an, yet another argument to say you can't just expect that um, when you tell people they can't use their car, they're going to say, OK, because a lot of it is also rethinking the way uh, everyday life is done. But it's also so much easier to put in words what you want than it is to actually have to put it on a physical map and see how you can get the space in. You can say a lot of that can be related to tactical urbanism, um, which is short-term actions for long-term change. The idea is to pro uh, provide test scenarios, traffic experiments that can inform long-term implications. And it's also to promote citizens' engagement and create ownership to the projects. And um, Ludon and Garcia, who wrote this book in 2015 on, on project, uh, tactical urbanism, say that it's basically possible because of the renewed love affair with the city and mostly within the demographic of the millennials um, who moves back or stays in cities that promotes walking, cycling and public transportation, while at the same time focusing on cultural, commercial and recreational opportunities. So it's another focus on saying it's not just about the flows, it's not just about getting efficiently from one part of the city to the other, it's basically also about the kind of life we have here uh, and the things we experience on the way. And a lot of that actually comes back to storytelling, which I'm not going to talk much about. I'm just going to say it here because it is important. It was also an important part of the planning of these two or the neighborhood streets in Copenhagen. Stories has a fundamental persuasive character when it comes to making decisions on the future of cities. This is also what the architects use. They use stories to visions when they want politicians and planners to make decisions. And articulation and storytelling enhances what Hayek calls the ontological expansion, which is the transformative capacity of planners to create things that don't exist. So by using the right stories, we can also rethink things or to figure out what is it that we are taking for granted or how is it that we think the world works. It goes on in politics, we become freer and richer with the car. It's a barrier for growth, no doubt about that. I don't think we can find one economist that disagree with the fact that if we take away the toll on the bridge, we become a richer society. Or if you put taxes on mobility and on moving stuff around, then we get a poorer society. That's simply not up for discussion. This is a former transport minister we have. That So there was a lot of these stories about what the car does and how um, we can't be a wealthy society without that is very much alive in politics. But we also use it in planning. This is Copenhagen's strategy for their cycling policy. In Copenhagen, we don't have cyclists. We merely have people transporting themselves by bike because you don't want to put them into a category of being some lycra cycling thing. It's just people. It's the easiest way to do it. So they just transport themselves by bike. So there is also a specific way of telling that story. I'm almost done. Just wanted to show you this last thing, which was basically one of our big cities in Denmark as well, Ulenser which um, has been deciding to be a climate neutral city. Uh, and they uh, invited, um, they made a task force of different experts um, and had two things on traffic. One was the zero emission zones in 2030. Another one was the traffic plan and promoting green active mobility. There was a lot of complaints about the zero emission zones. 
much less complaints about the traffic plan promoting green active mobility. In reality, the consequences of both those plans were actually the same, but the one was more talking about the urban space. So that was much more positively received than the one talking about zero emission zones. And in the public debate, there was these different kind of things coming out. Climate initiatives cannot have social inequality where we make it impossible for people in Odense who live in the suburbs to work in the city if they don't have an EV. I would have to move to another place to keep my current mobility and let my friends visit me without demanding that they change so fast, or they haven't thought of city life at all, the city will for sure slowly die. So all these negative responses was basically to the zero emission, but there was a lot of positive responses to redoing the urban space without cars allowed. Um, and basically one of the things we know, and these are the stories we don't talk about. And also because you can see it's commuting that is up, but over 30% of car journeys in Europe cover a distance of less than three kilometers, 50% cover less than five. These distances can be covered with 20, 15 to 20 minutes by bicycle or 30 to 50 minutes by walking. In the EU, many trips are short and most of them are made by car. This contributes to over 30% of adults being insufficiently active during a typical week and to a prevalence of obesity that increases by 10 to 40% between, uh, 40 between late 80s and late 90s. And it's known for many years that emissions from transport, particularly road traffic, contributes to poor air quality, which is the world's leading environmental health risk factor. So all these things are from the International Council on Clean Transport. So these numbers, it's not uh, NGOs that are making them. They also do it. But all this is also part of official documents on EU and UN um, level. And this is um, my second last slide. And that's basically just to say, so we know these things, we know that there's a lot of short trips. And I think one of the things we actually saw during Corona was this street with the tables are basically a place where there used to be parked cars, but because there was, um, people weren't allowed to sit inside, they needed to make more space outside. So something that hadn't been possible like in ever to take away the parking spaces to make more outdoor life suddenly became possible. And I've seen that in other cities around the world as well, that suddenly things became possible and it became clear, okay, it actually, we can actually make things work even if we don't have that many parking spaces. And the transporter is just, it's a really black sense of humor, but I actually really thought it was funny. It was in the beginning of the corona it says no one should be allowed to drive again until there are no fatal accidents for 14 consecutive days. Then we can slowly begin to phase in certain classes of people who begin driving again, but at only half the post speed limit. Hashtag safety. And it basically relates to the way that the close, the close down of all society is and how we could slowly start to opening it up because, um, and this is always a difficult issue, but of course there, there is no other technology where we are accepting that many people dying or get hurt every year. Um, and we, it's not that we're not working on safety, but we are actually accepting a technology that kills a lot of people. And the last thing I wanted to do was just make commercial for my new book, uh, Making Mobilities Matter, that is coming out now. But a lot of the things that I've been talking about here is basically what is in this book, um, just more expanded and you can see I also have a chapter four and five on communities and emotions because I think those are two very essential elements in people's lives that we need to take more seriously. Thank you very much for the time. Excellent, Malena. Um, thank, thank you so much for this fascinating uh, presentation and very thoughtful uh, one combining um, the, the the life of our of all the people, the, the senses of, of people in terms of mobility and the technology that enables or hinders uh, hinders that and, and the role of technology therein. Um, first, now we have the question and answer uh, session. So in case uh, the audience has uh, questions, please raise your hand or put them into the chat. And uh, we have also uh, some students here. Uh, so do you have? Any instant questions, reflections on Malena's uh, lecture? 
they're gathering there. <laughs> uh, it was a lot of words. In yes. <laughs> yeah. they need to. So. Uh, do you think, Malena, that uh, that public players, decision makers, um, can collect, or in in the case of Copenhagen, let's make it very clear: do they collect and monitor? Uh, the senses of people, how people perceive the city, the, uh, how people perceive the opportunities uh, the cities have made for everyday mobilities, um, whether they encourage sustainable mobility, whether they, they um, provide the means, the spaces, everything that is needed for sustainable mobilities. Or, like, does the city know? Yeah, I think the city knows, and um, I would be one of those claiming that actually the biggest problem is the national politicians, because it's not the planners. They know and they want to do a lot of things. Um, and of course, there's still opposition there, but they know and they are trying with a lot of small things. Um, for instance, we just had a new and a lot, a lot, a lot of metro buildings in Copenhagen because we are expanding the metro. And that basically meant that close that there was roads that closed that you could never close. Like you can't close this road, but then they had to be closed because of the metro thing. So they were closed for two years. And what happened some of the places was that while they were closed, these roads, the sidewalks and the uh, bike path got broader. And this is not something that was basically up for a big discussion or through all sorts of things. I more see it as some planners who just took the opportunity to grab some space. Uh, and they used this, the fact that they had to redo the sidewalks, let's do them a little bit broader. So I think it's, it's my clear sense that the planners actually have a lot of ideas and a lot of things they want to do. But on national poli politics, it's really complicated because we have put the car into a position where we can't say anything. This is also why I have to disclaim a slide. You can't say anything because then it explodes in, um, there is either you love the car, you hate the car. Sometimes it's like everything that's in between doesn't exist. And I think especially the national politicians are quite afraid of that. Yes. Yeah, yeah quite, quite agree. but. Maybe even go go here a step further. You you also talked about the history of technology and how that has affected uh, our everyday mobilities and also the information of communication. Also the fancy uh, pictures of autonomous vehicles and and uh, and those pictures without life. Um, the technology, in a way, seeks to be even more complicated, even more smart. But actually, the solutions might be very simple. So how to reduce the complexity in urban mobility? Mm. I think that one of the things that I've experienced in Denmark and like you always have this hype with a new technology that is basically it, it can do everything. We can use it for everything. And then at some point it basically goes down again and find a level. And I would say the going down came much sooner for in, in Copenhagen than I expected. And a lot of that was basically about picking the low hanging fruits. Why do we have to spend all this money on all this technology and all this when there is a lot of things we could do that is just simple and that doesn't cost us a lot of money. And I think a lot of this, um, like the short trips, the enormous amount of short trips, that why is it that we are not basically, okay, let's start there, let's start with the short trips. Uh, let's start with replacing the short trips. And one of the things that there is also new research showing because this station proximity concept that you have like 500 meters, uh, that's what, how much people wanna to walk to a station. Um, but yeah, if they're walking uh, on a small sidewalk next to a big road with a lot of cars, but now there's research that shows you can actually get people to walk 1.3, maybe even more if they walk through a nice urban area. So there's also, I think there is in Denmark right now, there is a tendency of basically the, the car is still an issue that is really difficult to discuss, but, it, but there is more... Uh, a wish to basically pick some of the low hanging fruits. How can we actually redo some of the urban centers without putting a lot of construction money in it, but actually just remake small connections, think about uh, how to do the city without the car as the number one priority. And so I think that's, um, 
And I also think we have these, we had these electrical buses in urban areas and they don't work. It's nice and the tourists like them and the kids like it because it saved them a 10 minute walk, but they can't drive very fast because those kind of technologies needs clean spaces and nobody wants a clean space. They clean spaces are for highways, they're not for cities. So I think there's a lot of these things where we actually exactly forget the lived life and we forget, um, I mean, the other thing with these automated buses that we had to uh, try out in Copenhagen is that at that point when it came in, my son was like 14, now he's older and a little bit more responsible. But I mean, 14, I could easily see him and his friends having so much fun with constantly stopping the automatic bus by just putting a foot out or doing like this and see how it stuck. So it's the space, there's so many things in it that doesn't work. It works between cities, but not in cities. And I think, I think in Copenhagen, they actually pretty quickly came to that realization but i think it it came along with this more and more focused on the livability and the openness of the city and the the actually trying to slow down pace some places um and we had a city architect who said she actually don't care about mobility as she said i just want people to stay more in spaces and and move slower through spaces so that's why she was promoting walking and cycling but it wasn't because of what they were doing it was just because she wanted to have this urban life and urban life and speed is just a bad combination yeah so and and if you if you have um, you have a, like where, where to start from uh, you you brought now two examples from uh, lively streets uh, in Copenhagen that were made those amber st streets. Mm -hmm. So there there are people there is life, uh, but what about the social pri or spatial prioritization? Uh, what about people who live in uh, deprived neighborhoods? What mm -hmm. about people who live in suburban areas uh, which are or already existing? They are not mm -hmm. new ones, but already existing. So how to approach? Uh, the mobility solutions there? I would say it's actually one of the big problems is that the more livable you make a city, the more you gentrify it and the more you make it for a specific group of people. So that's one of these big dilemmas we have. Does that mean it's a bad idea? Uh, or how do we actually handle that? Because we have um, deprived areas in Copenhagen who are unless they are very much in the inner city of Copenhagen, but the ones that just are a little bit on the outside, they are the ones who have all the big roads on each side and uh, less access to public transport. And uh, so basically a lot of these areas are quite nice on the inside, but they're all locked in um, in a, a shell of uh, heavy uh, transport. And it is a big issue. Um, I just did um, in the middle of a big research project where we are trying to promote mobility as a service. And what we have to see is that the mobility providers who are part of the project, they don't want to go to the private areas. They want to go to the rich areas because we have diff three different kinds of areas. And it is a serious issue. Um, and the only thing, um, the, the best thing I can answer it with is basically saying that the more we change the other places that, that it will have effects that comes after uh, um, and of course there is also basically fighting that they get better access but I think that the, the following consequences is basically what they need to have because I always when people are saying we can't make EVs because those who don't have a lot of money can't afford to buy a new car so they can't have a car and then I'm thinking it's all fine that you talk about that but you never talk about the fact that all those with less money are the ones living next to the big roads to get all the pollution and all the noise so again it's one of these situations where there are certain elements of the unintended consequences of the car we don't talk about but it is an issue and it is an issue with Liverpool cities it is an issue with Copenhagen that it's getting more and more expensive um, <coughs> and I think that communication doesn't do it alone but the fact that there was actually somebody telling those stories as well and that also gives them the feeling that because the, this this two areas where I was talking about with the research we're doing, we're of course doing it together with them. It turned out that the people in the deprived areas knew knew much more about these different uh, mobility providers and what kind of 
service they were providing than the people in the rich areas. So I was looking at it thinking it could actually be, it would have been a much better business case for you. But there's also a lot of certain ways of um, seeing mobility and seeing who uses mobility that is uh, that also needs to, to come out in the light somehow. Um, that we need to be better at the talking about the unintended consequences, the problems there is, and how mobility is unequal. It is, it's unequally distributed. Uh, it has humongous gender issues um, that we also hardly talk about. This is also the hard and soft discussion is um, also in that category. Um, so there is, there is actually, it is a business that has been dominated by certain disciplines and certain genders. And of course that influenced it in a specific way. Um, but I do see that there are things happening now where there are some of these discussions that we, things that we didn't even talk about before that we are starting to discuss. Um, so, but, but it, is a, it is a problem. Yeah, so, so we have to start somewhere. So of yeah. course, good, good to be aware of that. Um, Siri. <laughs> Yes, Akko has a question. Uh, so, um, COVID-19 has uh, certainly had several impacts uh, to the narratives we have about mobilities. And uh, one type of uh, mobility that I, I think has received a lot of uh, impact is public transportation. Uh, because uh, at least in Estonia, and I know that in many other countries as well, people simply feel more fear uh, before using public transportation. There are different ways to adapt. One is simply to, at the moment, wait. Maybe people will lose their fear as the epidemic uh, goes more silent. Uh, or the other one is to actively seek some innovations that, that would make people feel more secure when using it. Do you know any interesting examples where the such innovations are taking place or people are thinking about how to transform the transportation. I, can you just repeat the last or maybe Ogi, you can repeat because I didn't exactly get the last part of the question. The question repeat. Yeah. Uh, do you know any uh, any places or yeah. use cases where such innovations are tested or uh, uh, maybe somewhere new public transportation ways are trying or, or tried to be created? Um, no, uh, I would say there was a lot of things that happened after Corona. And I have also been part of both discussing that with the public transport systems in Denmark. Uh, it is a huge problem that, um, that public transportation was deemed as one of the most dangerous things in the world uh, because of uh, COVID-19 um that they now need to find a way to recover from but i know some of the discussions i've been part of has basically very much been about rethinking public transportation so instead of just going back to how public transportation was before it's more been how can we actually make a public transportation some so for instance People like to work on trains, but they don't like to work on buses. What can we do that the workspace in the bus actually work? You can bring your bike on the train, but you can bring it on the bus. How can we actually do that? Can we make specific zones in the bus as well? So they basically, what I see right now is going on, but it's totally new, but that is basically rethinking public transportation to be more than just transport this is what they're all occupied with they're also occupied with making the seats more comfortable in the buses uh, this is a project that was between denmark and norway um so i think i don't i haven't seen i don't i haven't seen any innovative and i haven't seen um, any research on it now the only thing i know is basically from practice but i can see that what they're thinking is not to go back to where they were before Corona, but rethink the system, rethink what what public transport is, what you can do in public transport, how you can work, how you can socialize. In reality, you could take the automotive, automating, automation pictures and put it into the way public transport is, is now thinking a lot to redo the concept of public transport. 
but but all of it as I have seen is just on this discussion level so far. Yeah. So again, another uh, aspect with public transit and uh, COVID-19. So we started to do a lot more teleworking and, and uh, this continues even now. So of course we are recovering, going back to our offices. But with teleworking, um, the need for organized transportation also reduced, also the need for public transit. But uh, our, our time budget for transport or for mobilities is actually like normally the same. We just maybe transform uh, the aim of that of our mobility. We don't go to work, but we go to leisure destinations. Mm. And those are those are like less structured, less organized, uh, and we lean maybe more and more on private transportations because our destinations have changed uh, during the corona pandemic. So, do you see that this might also like? be a long lasting uh, effect of this corona time uh, that that we lose the need for public transit and we rely more and more on private transport on irregular times also we have, working. it could be it could be one of the outcomes and of course it it this just doesn't happen by itself it also it has a lot to do with policy and planning on transportation how this is going to fold out but there's also the other option that People can now work from home. They don't need the car to commute every day. Uh, their employer realized that uh, working doesn't necessarily only happens when you're sitting on your desk at work, but can actually happen all sorts of places from. I heard uh, one of the big company leaders in Denmark, um, they are basically after Corona scaling down on the, um, the indoor spaces, the seating. Um, and he said, yeah, yeah, but I don't like it calling called it working from home I just call it working from another place than your workplace and I think that was actually a very precise way because some people are also going to cafes and some people are going other places and I think in that sense the the bus companies started thinking about okay in the future these people they don't care if it takes an hour to go to work on bus because that's part of their working hours so I think that could be one of the things but I do think there is an issue with the leisure time and it is an issue, um, but I'm just not sure that we, that I, I still believe in public transport that it's gonna rise. And I think it's because if we wanna do something about the private or the climate change and the problem with CO2, we need to do something about the private car. And I think the more we get mobility as a service we can't do mobility as a service without the public transport as the backbone. It has to be the backbone in a system like that. Um, and then I think we should start problematizing uh, leisure travel. And I'm seriously trying to write an article about it. It's really difficult. I'm not doing very well because it is really difficult how to frame it. But I'm what I'm seeing in Denmark is that you have a car because you have to go to your summer cottage or you have to visit your parents and it takes longer with public transport and i'm thinking okay since when was leisure time also something that had to be efficient why is it that visiting your parents can't take one and a half hours until you get there and you sit on the train and look out the window and drink some coffee that also has to be efficient so there is something which is that because of the time pressure of everyday life or is it just another way to enable us to keep that car that we love so much. I don't know. And I think I don't have a, a clear answer to it, but I think there is something going on with this leisure mobility is that do, are we really not able to say, okay, that's not a good idea because we have a problem with this technology. It's, it's polluted too much. We need to use it much better than we do today. And maybe um, it's not, we, when you easily can take the train or, um, bike to the summer coach because it's nice, then you shouldn't have a car on the parking lot taking up all that urban space. But I, I know it's still difficult to discuss, but the problem is also that the only ones that take seriously what the car actually also is, is the car companies and the way they're making commercials because they're so good at it. They are the ones who it basically seriously know how much more than just movement there is in a car. And if you look at car commercials, the way they're doing it, how many there is of them, and they are they're putting their finger on all the right spots. So, yeah, but I, I think public transport will survive. 
<laughs> Let's keep our fingers crossed for yeah. that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for this very interesting presentation and also the discussion. I think it was very fruitful. And my question is about uh, this uh, temporary project. That how how you think about that, or what is your opinion? How how they will change the people's behavior in a long term that you hmm. have some uh, small project you brought some uh, examples and there was uh, um, quite um, one project in in charge of this uh, car free uh, street but how you think that they will change the city sit one is the city case but the other is the the behavior of the people that they can um, Used to use uh, walking or biking. Mm. If, if some uh, some place is temporarily closed, or there are some uh, other activities there, I think that it actually. I think it means a lot. I think there's a lot of potential in in urban planning because I think um, there is this Danish social anthropologist that is talking about how you get to change people's practice or behavior, and she talks about these. Um, breaks and slides and displacements. That's basically her way of saying it. And a break would be a big break in your life would be that you got divorced or somebody died or something like that. Um, um, a slide would be that you got a new job or you got a new workplace. And the displacements are basically these small things that for instance, there is a road construction or something like that. And we know the place where they, you have the best success of changing people's behavior is uh, when they change between different life phases or they change a job or they change their living place. And I think in that sense, urban planning or redoing street, having street experiments actually has a lot of potential mm -hmm. because it, um, it takes you out of that daily routine. Uh, I always give this example of when I moved um, 800 meters, maybe it was 10 years ago, I moved from one place to the other 800 meters and maybe it was also because it was so short but I was totally confused in the beginning because my brain just still wanted to do what I normally did when I biked to the station but there was basically another way that was faster but because my life was basically getting on the bike and going to the train station without thinking about it because I was occupied with a million other things that I was thinking about. So it's just something my body did. It was just this bodily movement. And so much of our everyday mobility is just that. It's just, we just do the same thing. We don't, it's basically like when we get up in the morning, we don't every day redo if we brush our teeth first, eat breakfast, uh, take a shower, put clothes on or make our bed we basically do it more or less the same way in the, exactly the same routine every morning and mobility is part of that. So I think when suddenly somebody is putting um, a, a barrier in that, you, you need to rethink it and you need to redo it. And then you maybe realize, okay, this actually works too. Um, this, um, I know uh, I have a lot of stories for people I interviewed that they moved to a new place or something happened in the neighborhood and so suddenly they started cycling and okay that's actually really nice and now they're just doing that but so I think there's so much of that's not really because we don't want to change or because we don't want to redo it but it's just because this is how life works and this is how we get things done and we don't have time to think about it so I actually think these small projects has a lot of potential because they basically okay, something new is going on. I need to figure out how to organize my life around that. Um, so that can take people out of these routines, this normalization on how we do things. You know, some good practices, for example, that, that there is uh, some cities or some regions where it's uh, like, um, I have had in some discussions that in Munich have, like on, on Saturday have in streets have this cafes or some temporary one, but they can um, extend the time that then it's, uh, it, it will extend it to permanent. Mm. To have some examples in some cities or some streets or somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, and I think this thing of there has been a lot of critique of this thing with the experiments, but I actually think experiments is a really good idea because I think it gives the planners a tool or NGOs or whoever is working with it not to take the big fight, but just to, to um, we just want this small piece of the cake and then they 
take a little bit more and a little bit more and people figure out it is extremely difficult for people to imagine if this is the car space this is where i leave my car now they want to take it away that's extremely difficult to imagine but when they then try it out and figure out okay it's actually not that big of a problem and wow it's cool what's going on out here so i think a lot of it is experiments has the um and and i think there is a lot of examples on that suddenly the resistance against something was smaller because it was not just thoughts or ideas or you want to redo how I get my life work, but it was a, an embodied experience of what it actually meant that something was different that actually worked. Uh, I think people are not very, um, they're not really happy to change because we have so much stuff we have to do and so many things we have to remember and you want me to redo it, it doesn't work, but okay, now I can get it to work anyways because this is how it is. And I think this is, just one of these things we need to take seriously with um, with how people work and how they get their everyday life to work. So I think I think experiments are, and in Munich they also have this like then they make an urban beach somewhere or they so they are actually really good at um, they have these um, urban astronauts they're calling themselves that are redo they are doing these things. Um, so I, I'm actually I'm, I'm a big um, I think experiments has a lot of potential because it makes us see things in new ways we can't imagine. Exactly. We get the experience. Yeah. We, yes. Yeah. And, and uh, we end our today's session with a note from uh, Ximin Huang. So indeed, instead of smart city, we need smart urbanism. Yeah. Often what we have seen in Copenhagen or Amsterdam is that retail streets have been chosen to be the test bed to promote more space for slow mobility. In case of Tartu, the city is unfortunately centered by three shopping malls and a large amount of parking spaces. Probably we should rethink the mobility options hand in hand, cultivating different kinds of shopping behavior, consumer culture together here in Estonia. And, and we end with this uh, note. And I also want to thank once again, uh, Malene, you for your very uh, thoughtful, insightful uh, lecture today and the discussion that continued. And uh, we welcome all of you here, uh, back here next Tuesday, when we will have um, uh, a lecture by Professor Tuli Toivonen from the University of Helsinki. Uh, who will give a lecture on the topic of analyzing accessibility and mobility for planning of sustainable and equitable cities. So welcome back next week. Meanwhile, our recording of today's lecture will be uploaded to the Transport Planning Course website. Thank you, Malena. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you, see you this summer at Mobile Tartu. Yep, I look forward. Bye. Bye.